Also on Mondays, we shine a spotlight on medical matters and speculations are rife about the type of viral loads that are circulating as we uh, get into winter season this year. There are questions about what the 100-day cough is like. Is this avian flu? Is this swine flu? Are we dealing with influenza A, influenza B? What is the difference? Um, just some of the questions that we are aiming to um, understand a little bit better, just because we're looking at the impact that, um, you know, this has had early on, the impact on health, um, public health, um, how better to understand understand what we're facing and to mitigate against um, some of the, the uh, issues that could come to the fore, particularly if affecting the most vulnerable groups, children, the elderly, pregnant um, people, and of course people living with chronic conditions. So we're going to unpack all this and more on this Monday Medical Matters edition. For this, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Alison Glass, clinical virologist at Lancet Laboratories. Good morning, Dr. Alison, morning. and thank you for joining us on the SABC at this hour. Thank you. All right, so winter is once again um, here well, in some parts of the country and we're looking at some of the um, viral loads that have been circulating and some of the speculations, questions about what is happening this mm. time around. Perhaps you could talk to the phenomenon occurring, the reality on the ground that it's mm. had to date. Okay, so we are seeing a lot of respiratory tract infections and quite a lot of quite ill people. Yes. Uh, but what we're seeing predominantly is influenza A. So during the winter, we have our influenza season, which is influenza A and B, although influenza A tends to predominate. And it's just started a little bit earlier this year where we normally see our peak levels in June, July. We are already seeing very, very high numbers from the end of April. Um, so that is what is causing the majority of the bad infections we're seeing at the moment. All right, so thank you for painting that picture because we want to look at some of the signs and symptoms and just in relation to some of the questions about, you know, what is circulating. Mm. Talk to us about what you're experiencing and witnessing this time round. So the typical uh, signs and symptoms of, of influenza is is much that of other respiratory infections as well. Mm. So it's fever, body aches, headache, sore throat, a dry cough. Um, but And what we really are seeing is, is quite um, a high number. So each flu season varies. So some years we'll have a mild flu season. This year we're having what appears to be particularly aggressive influenza A season. Um, reasons for that could be because we didn't see much influenza during the, the worst part of the pandemic because everything was pre dominant, predominantly um, COVID and we saw yes. very little influenza. And it's possible now that people's immune systems, uh, you know, they uh, have has the, the immunity to influenza from the past has waned a little bit and we've seen people who are more susceptible now to, to influenza and that gives this virus an opportunity now to, to be, run a bit more rampant than, than the last few years. Because I actually wanted to touch on the issue of testing and trying mm -hmm. to understand what's coming to the fore. I mean, are tests available? Are people sufficiently testing to distinguish between, you know, the different mm. um, viral yes. um, quish, uh, viral loads sorry, that, that is circulating, hence dispelling some of the, the speculations mm. that are rife at this mm. point? vaccines as well yeah what what is available if you have co if you had COVID, should you to be taking the flu vaccine mm -hmm. if you took the flu vaccine is it for influenza a is it for influenza v mm. what, what what does that all mean okay. for us so from a testing point of view so we've always had testing available for influenza and since COVID, the COVID and the influenza have now been combined in our pcr testing where if we do a, a test for flu we will test is this influenza a or b or is this COVID? so so that all gets combined now in one one test so that we can help the doctors distinguish we recommend that people who are sick enough to be hospitalized or who are at risk for severe disease get tested because there is specific treatment in that setting for influenza and it can help to distinguish. But we don't recommend that your average person who gets a uh, flu and just needs to stay at home and rest uh, should test because there it's not going to make a difference to your treatment. But we do do sufficient testing of people who are very ill and requiring hospitalization to know what's circulating. So we do see a little bit of COVID still. It's still there we see it um, you know at a constant sort of low level mm. uh, but we can definitely say that at the moment the majority of, of the respiratory tract infections are influenza A. Okay. Vaccines are available once again the flu vaccines always been available so it's a, a very it's been a 
in the market a long time. So it's a tried and tested vaccine. They adapt it every year to, uh, based on what was circulating in the Northern Hemisphere during the winter time. So they try and predict what will be circulating locally uh, and adapt the, vi the vaccine to that. And the vaccine does help to reduce severity of infection and reduce the likelihood of getting infection. Um, the COVID vaccine doesn't provide any cross protection to influenza and vice versa. So we do recommend that people get the influenza vaccine. It's available at pharmacies. Um, it's relatively inexpensive, certainly less expensive than ha having to get medicines and stay off work for, uh, you know, for days. Um, and for me, it's really worth, um, you know, not feeling horrible for two weeks, you know, get a flu vaccine. And more importantly, the more people who are vaccinated, the more we protect the vulnerable people who would be at mm. risk for severe disease. What about antibiotics and the use mm. of antibiotics? resistance to antibiotics yeah. what is that impact also having on what we're witnessing this okay. time around what can communities also do to mm. better mitigate yeah. So, yeah, so I think the important thing for everyone to remember is that antibiotics don't work against viruses, they work against bacteria. Okay. So antibiotics won't help for influenza. And I, I think that for the community, just to say, please don't put unnecessary pressure on your doctor to give you antibiotics. A lot of GPs say, well, they feel so pressurized by their patients to give them an antibiotic, even if they think it's a viral infection. So okay. understand if your doctor says he doesn't think uh, antibiotics are necessary, don't take them unnecessarily because it's the unnecessary use of antibiotics that contributes to resistance. And, you know, taking antibiotics when it's not needed can have other negative effects. So, so take antibiotics when the doctor suspects a bacterial infection, but for influenza, uh, you know, the, the antibiotics wouldn't be indicated. Because the flu is ever evolving, I wonder mm. if we could look at some of the, um, you know, if there are new treatments available, just yeah. given what transpired in the Northern Hemisphere. But if we're going to also combine other forms of treatment, mm. what would you say could be complementary for this season? So for one thing, for the average healthy individual who gets influenza and is not at risk for severe disease, there we don't give specific treatment. There it would be symptomatic treatment, treat the fever, rest. Uh, you know, there's sort of anecdotal uh, evidence for things like zinc being of benefit, but you know, those are, as I say, anecdotal. So the most important thing is, is rest. Um, and, and managing fever and body aches with something like paracetamol. People want a quick fix, but unfortunately, at the end of the day, the rest is the important thing. Um, for people who need heart to be hospitalized because they're that sick or they're at risk for severe disease, like your elderly or those with heart and lung diseases, mm -hmm. there is specific treatment called oseltamivir that is available, um, and doctors would prescribe it in, in those sort of settings where someone is at risk for severe influenza. Because we're trying to you know, sift through and dispel some of the misconceptions Perceptions, misinformation, mm. disinformation, just, so it's just surrounding um, what's coming to the flu at this point. What is the most important thing you, want, thing you want people to walk away with regarding the trends yeah. that are emerging? You spoke about it specifically being more about influenza uh, A yeah. rather than influenza B. Yeah, so I think the most important take-home message is we know what respiratory infections are about. We've all been through the pandemic. We had it drummed into our brains about you know, hand washing, alcohol yes. hand rub, social distancing, staying at home if you don't feel well. Those are exactly the same principles that apply here. So, so just encourage everyone not to have a, a, a bad short-term memory. The same things that will protect you against a, an infection with COVID is going to protect against infections with influenza. Um, so, you know, if you are feeling unwell, you know, be, be considerate of those around you. Wear a face mask again. You know, face masks are now acceptable things in public. We know what they're about. Um, and uh, consider staying at home if you're not well so that you protect, uh, protect other people around you because you may not get it that severely, but, but others may. Mm, absolutely. I, I wonder also, stomach flu is something mm. that I've heard. Um, there was that 100-day cough as well. There's yeah. uh, headaches that some people experience. Mm. Um, talk to us about some of those signs in relation yeah. to, to the phenomenon you spoke about, influenza A. Yeah, so gastrointestinal infections that we do see flaring up from time to time, and that can be related uh, you know, to, to source outbreaks where there's been, well, I mean, one thing is with, with load shedding where we see breakdown in refrigeration, that does contribute to the burden of gastrointestinal disease, poor water supplies contribute to, the, uh, to gastrointestinal disease. Um, and the 100 day cough, that's, that is a bacteria, that's, that's whooping cough. And I think, but I think the important thing with all these infectious diseases is relatively simple preventative measures around 
good hand hygiene. I mean, just the ba that for gastrointestinal infections can, goes a long way in reducing the burden of that. Mm -hmm. Trying to have for gastrointestinal infections having access to safe safe drinking water. But the, sort of the very basic primary healthcare principles, which we we were also aware of during the pandemic, kind of goes out of everybody's mind when it comes to all the other infections. Um, and but it really those simple practices can help to really reduce the burden of a wide range of infectious diseases. Mm. And I mean, thank you very much for joining us at this hour on the SAV, spelling some of those myths because, you know, this impacts the public health at large. And so we're looking at how we can best prepare. Um, we're having some sunny weather up in here, yeah. but obviously on the coast we've seen um, it's colder. So um, we're going to see the impact that all of this is having. Um, uh, we'll leave that conversation there for now. Clinical virologist at Lancet Laboratories, Dr. Alison Glass, chatting to us about the flu that's infecting many people this season, how best we can also prevent it. She joined us, of course, on this Monday Medical Matters edition.